church. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. How many of you know that there is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, amen? We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory.
when you wipe those tears away I cry word above every other name you are worthy never stop singing your praise never stop singing your praise about a relational issue, maybe it's a health issue, 
Let's just choose the data no matter what. No matter what, we're to declare that you are worthy of every breath that I breathe. You are worthy. If you're comfortable in this place, just lift your hands to heaven. Lord, we thank you that your spirit is in this place. There's healing in this place today. Lord, there is joy in this place today. There is peace that passes all understanding here today. Lord, we choose no matter what we face as we go out this week, this month, this year, the rest of our lives, that we will choose to say, you are worthy, Father. You are worthy. No matter what mountain we're facing, Father, you are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our adoration. So we commit in our hearts that we will say that. You are worthy, King Jesus. You loved us so much. You're a good Father. And you poured your love out for us. Therefore, in return, we decry that you are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. Amen, church. Let's just lift up praise. Let's lift up adoration to the King. Oh, he alone is worthy. He's the reason we're here. And it is so good to be joined with a group of believers and just to declare his holiness, declare that he alone is worthy. I just pray that even as we worship this morning, that faith and hope rose up within you rose up within your spirit. And I would just challenge you as you leave out of here today and you go about your week and every people you face, no matter what circumstance, what situation, declare the praises of the one who saved us. Declare he alone is worthy. Amen. Well, there's a great service ahead of us. Before you see it, just turn around and greet the person. Say hello to those around them. Tell them God is a good God. for worshiping with us. We have a lot of great things going on here at the Heights. Here are a few ways that you can get involved right now. You can also check out our website at heightslife.org slash events to see everything we have going on. And don't forget to follow us on social media. A great way to stay connected is by downloading the Church Center app. There, you can easily contact us, give, you can view any of our events and sign up right there. You can also find and stay connected to any of our small groups. If you would like to give today, we have several ways to make it easier for you. You can visit our website at heightslife.org backslash give. You can text any amount to the number 84321 and include your campus name, or you could simply pick up an offering envelope and drop it off at the offering box at your campus. For more information, please visit our friends at Guest Central. You can check us out on the web at heightslife.org or shoot us an email at info at heightslife.org. Thanks again for choosing to worship with us today. Now, I'm Steve from Granbury. This is my wife, Joella. We've been attending Heights Church for quite a long while now. Our small group has uh, been going since early 2021. We started with first principles as a, a first group. The way it was first started was I simply asked, where are the small groups and who can we talk to about it? And they said, well, start one. So we did. <laughs> First Principles is an amazing uh, series, and we just decided to facilitate that and learn from the pastors by video and the books. Been going great. I wasn't sure I even wanted to get involved with it, but I'm so happy that I did. I've grown in, in my understanding, my knowledge, and 
I recommend it to anybody that just, just wants to grow in Christ. My church life has changed dramatically. I never expected to be in a small group because I'm just not a people person, really. <laughs> I don't let people get to know me. But after sitting down in our very first one, and now we're on our third one, I have developed relationships that I never expected to have, and they're all my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'd tell anybody to join a small group. Look into it at least. Uh, wherever you are in, in your, your maturity with Christ right now, you're going to grow. You're going to have fun. You're going to make some great, great friends. I think that you should run, don't walk to the nearest small group. It is going to make your life different. You're going to develop relationships and have a group that you can turn to, that can be there for you and you can be there for them. It's the only way to go. Good morning. Well, good to be here. Ready to do this. Worship was good, amazing. I do want to remind you, ladies, Friday night at 7 o'clock is movie night. So, uh, I don't know. Give your kids to your husbands. Husbands, do a good thing and watch the kids and let the ladies come to movie night. Did y'all get a handout? If you didn't get a handout, 7 o'clock Friday night, right? Okay, good. I got a yes. So there you go. There's your announcement. Now, so so glad you guys are here. It's going to be a good day. We're in our empowerment series, Green Light. Obviously, why do we call it Green Light? Because empowerment means go. Get it done. Time to move, right? All right, you guys stand to your feet. Let's decree over the service. Let's get into empowerment. Stand up. Hold your hands out. Close your eyes. Get ready to receive. Let's decree. Father, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you for your purpose and presence. God, we thank you, that Holy Spirit, that you're here. Move in our hearts today. Let us understand. Let us hear what you're saying. God, most of all, let us understand that you've empowered us as the church to go. And today we decree, this is my season of walking in my promised land. Things may look dry and barren, but God is causing me to advance and go forward. He is strengthening and energizing me when I feel defeated. I am and will be strong and courageous, for my breakthrough is now, and my God is showing me my victory. My place of trial will be my place of triumph. Every place that looks like barrenness is bursting into blessing. My very opposition is now becoming my opportunity. I declare now all the seeds that have been sown through prayer and in my giving, which have been dormant, are now waking up to accomplish their purpose for my life. Those things that God has spoken over me are true, and I will become what he says I will be. I am headed into superabundance in my promised land. The giants are defeated, the walls are coming down, and it is time for increase in my life. My promised land is here, and I will walk in it. For I walk with victory and not to it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You guys can be seated. Praise God. Listen, last week, if you were here, uh, we talked about empowerment and just how to walk in an empowering life. And we're going to continue that today. Last week, we read in Mark chapter 6, and we got to the point where Jesus fed the 5,000. And there was an interesting line that he said in that, and he told his disciples, you give them something to eat. And so really, when you think about empowerment, this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you give them something to eat, and when you go and do everything you can, then I'll meet you right there. When you're at the end of it, you've done everything you can, then I'll turn it into blessing. I'll extend it. I'll make it more. And so uh, that just struck me all week about that. You give them something to eat. And so I've really thought about that and just thought, you know, if we really are the church, if we're the ecclesia, if we're the sent ones, we're the called out ones, then our job is to give those around us something to eat, something that glorifies God, something that points to him and honors him, amen? And so I gave you three points last week, and how, do, how are you empowered? By restoration, right? He restores us, he gets us in place. By expectation, that's an expectation that he puts on us, and then by multiplication. And so he tells us to give him something to eat, that's the expectation, and then he multiplies it once we step out in faith. We're going to talk a little bit more about that stepping out today. And a true follower of Christ uh, wants to be used by God. Anybody that has come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
They want to be used by God. They don't want to just be, we don't want to be just sitting here. I mean, if God is real and his power is real, then we want that to operate in our lives, right? There's some of you out here. Can I get an amen? Amen. So when you think of that, the whole idea is this, or, or this is the picture that I have. I want to go through this life. I want to do the best I can to glorify God. And when I get to heaven in front of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I just want him to say, well done, right? And so I don't know how else we can do that other than really focus on him, get to know him, and understand that he's empowered us to go out into the world and share the gospel, to share the goodness of God with those that are around us. And so the question is, how do we find this empowering life? How do we walk in it? What do we do? And I gave you a few last week. I'm going to give you some more this week. And I'm going to be in Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, if you have your Bibles or your device, you can go ahead and get started there. And I set this up for you. The Hebrews or the Israelites, they're standing on the east side of the Jordan River. They want to go to the other side. They know that they need to go to the other side. It's flood season, and so the river is overflowing. It's kind of taking over the land, so the river is moving at a high pace. And they're really at a moment of decision. And history tells us, we know this, that they actually make a decision and go to the other side. But the idea today, the principles that I hope you understand today is that how God got them to the place to go to the other side, how he empowered them to go through a river, a river that's in flood conditions. How did he get them to step into the river and get to the other side? And so today, hopefully, you'll get these principles of an empowered life, and we're going to start with this first principle. And they're all out of this passage here. Follow the Lord's lead. Follow the Lord's lead. And so as I give you these simple instructions, let's just start here in Joshua chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. And it says, and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Amen. So the first thing that, that is asked, the first thing that is said is, follow the Lord's lead. That's what he's saying. So if you know anything about the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God. And it, it, it uh, is the example or, or the representation of God's presence. And so what he's telling them is like, hey, listen, when you see it move, then you move. But don't get too close to it as to run out in front of it. So you've got to be far enough back that you see where it's going. And as it starts to go a direction, you go that direction. So for us, our principle is this. We don't want to go out before God. We want to go when God moves. So God moves before us. And so for it to be in a place of empowerment, uh, we don't want to go anywhere until God moves and God leads us that way. Once he starts to move, then we move. And if we'll do that, then we'll be moving in, in uh, sequence with God and we'll be able to be in the power of God. And you're going to see how this plays out uh, in this story as we read more through it. So I guess the best way for me to put it to you is watch to see what God is doing and then join him. Watch to see what God is doing and then join. Jesus said it very simply like this. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. And I only say what I hear him say. And so if we take Jesus' example, and we're Christians, and he's Jesus Christ, and so that means that we take his example, then we only want to do what we see him do. And many times in the church, it's not that we do wrong things. It's that we have bad timing. We, we run out and just go like we hear a word like, oh, I gotta go do this. I've done that so many times. I don't know about you, but I've done it so, oh yeah, that's what we gotta do. And I run out, and only to have to turn around and come back to this spot and hear God and then go get it done, right? Because I tried to do it in my own strength because I just knew this is what God wanted. And I didn't let him lead me to that. I just took off. And so we've gotta be very, very strategic in how we're responding to what God calls us to do because he will say something but there may be a time of waiting before we go and get it done. There may be a time that we have to sit back. And so, um, well, let me put it to you like this. Let's say that you meet somebody and you ask them on a date. You take them on a date, you have a good dinner, everything's going well, and then immediately, Charles, you drop to your knee and you say, marry me. <laughs> now, proposals are good, right? Timing is everything. I mean, first of all, she's like, dude, we're at McDonald's. I mean, what are you doing? You know, I mean, this is not romantic. Feed me a steak dinner, wine and dine me, whatever, but don't, at McDonald's? A McCafe is not gonna get it done, sir. You hear me, young people? But 
Timing is everything. Well, that's what it is right here. I mean, God, God, we're, wa- we're walking with God and we get these big dreams and, and things we wanna do and yet we don't wait. We don't wait for the perfect timing. We don't wait for God's timing. We just start to run and go get it done. And that gets us into a place of, of like bad place, right? God's timing is perfect, ours is flawed. Uh, too often our eagerness gets us out of the will of God. We run too hard, run too fast. I shared this in the, in the uh, first service. My father-in-law, when I met him, I, my dad didn't teach me how to construct things or build things. And so my father-in-law, Biff, uh, he taught me. And so we would work on things and, and uh, it would drive me crazy because as a young person, um, you know, it's just like measure it, build it, here we go. And so he would say measure it and then measure it again and then I think him, you know, somebody said measure it twice, but him it was like measure it six or seven times. You just keep measuring, right? But what I learned through time was every time that I would go out in my eagerness to do something really quick, it usually was wrong. But if I would go back and spend a little time and make sure and look and check, it actually would get built quicker because I would take the time to get it right the first time, right? And so this is the same thing. As, as you build a relationship with God and you allow him to lead you, you slow down enough to allow him to work in your life and lead you to know his voice, to see what he's doing, and you're gonna get it done right the first time and not have to go around the mountain over and over and over. I don't know about you, but going around the mountain over and over and over, Terry Hall, is not fun. It is not fun. So we just gotta honor God, and when he calls us to do something, that's great, but we can't run out until he says it's time to go. And so we gotta be led by God. And There's a couple examples I'll give you of, of people that... Uh, had to wait. The Israelites had to wait 40 years in the wilderness before they could get to a place with God. Joseph was in jail for many years before he was called by God to lead. Daniel was exiled to Babylon. Jesus was led out into the desert to be tempted. Paul spent three years in the desert before he went to the Gentiles, before he started his ministry. And Jesus often said, my time has not yet come. And so what I want to tell you today is that sometimes we just have to slow down enough to hear God and wait for the moment that he's ready to part the river, the Red Sea, so that we can go to the other side. Amen? So uh, it, it reminds me of a story that I read. I went and looked it up this week and spent some time in it, and this is perfect for this time. How many of you know the story of Esther? If you don't know the story of Esther, there's a whole book. She has her name on a book. It's called Esther. And uh, Anyway, she won a beauty contest, a Persian beauty contest, and she became the queen. I mean, what? What a story, right? She walks in, all the beauty, and the king's like, yep, queen. So she becomes a queen. She's Jewish, and she has actually an, uh, an uncle that's in that land, and he's a leader in that land. His name's Mordecai, or we'll call him Uncle Morty, and Uncle Morty is in that time, and, and there's another guy that's on the council of the king, and he hates Mordecai, and he hates Jews. And so what does he do? He comes up with a plan that he wants to get rid of. So Mordecai knows this, and Mordecai, Uncle Morty, goes to Esther and says, Esther, you're a queen. You have favor with the king, and here's what I need you to do. I need you to go before the king and tell him the plot of Haman so that we can be saved. But here's the deal. In that time, as a queen, you didn't get to go just before the king, even though you were his wife, even though you were the queen. You had to be invited. Well, she got some people together, and they prayed, and she decided to step out there and she got in front of the king. And so when she got in front of the king, the king said, hey, what can I do for you? And she said, well, let's have some lunch tomorrow. And the king agreed, and she invited Haman, the bad guy, and they came to lunch. And so they spent time, she served them. She didn't say anything about the situation with the Jews. And so uh, the king's like, what can I do for you? And she said, come back tomorrow for lunch. So the king goes home that day, and he's trying to sleep, and he can't sleep that night. And uh, so what he does is what all men do, he pulls out his register of being a king and looks at all the things that he's accomplished. Can you imagine? Only probably you think it'd bore him to, to sleep, right? But what he finds in there is that Uncle Morty saved his life. He thwarted a, an, ass, an assassination attempt. And so in the morning, he goes to Haman, who hates the Jews and hates Mordecai, and says, we need to honor this guy. We never honored him. And in that moment, Esther's like, the Lord's in this. And so when he comes to lunch that day, when the king comes to lunch with the queen, he knows that uh, Uncle Morty's being, or she knows that Uncle Morty's being uh, honored. And so this is what she says. She reveals Haman's plot. 
Haman actually gets hung on the gallows that he built for the Jews, for Mordecai, story over. She saved her people. But she waited until she knew that God was leading. So that's where we're at. There are things in our life that we want to get done, that we want to accomplish, but we got to wait on God to be able to get them done. And so he empowers us how? By leading us to where we need to go. Praise God. And so to have an empowered life, we must follow the Lord's lead. And now we're going to look in uh, chapter 3, verse 5. And the second point for you this morning is be spiritually prepared. So verse 5 says, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I just want to point out that how many, I want to see wonders among me. I don't know about you, but I want to see wonders. And this is what he says. He says, sanctify yourselves. I'm going to stop for a minute. I just, I can't get away from this. <clears throat> There's somebody in here or online, somebody, you've been in a, like a week or two weeks of darkness. Like literally you want to, you just want to end it. You, it's so heavy. Whew. You can't even, you, it's, you don't even know how you got here this morning. I want to tell you the very reason that you showed up this morning, that God will carry your burden away from you. God, if you will, the rest of this service, focus on letting God, even if you don't hear another word I say, if you'll just focus on God and allow him to carry this burden, he will heal you and he will restore you in the things that the canker worm has come to eat up in your life and, and make you think that there is no hope. God says, I am bringing hope to you today in this moment in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. Lord, I pray for this individual or individuals, God. God, I pray that you would bring the light of heaven into their life right now, God. God, they know who they are, and I pray that as their heart is pounding, that it is done in Jesus' name. God, they are released from this oppression and depression of the enemy, and God, there is wholeness coming into their life right now. There is victory right now in Jesus' name. God, we submit ourselves to you, Holy Spirit. Amen. So, <clears throat> getting back to uh, this, chapter three, verse five, it, the word there is sanctify or consecrate. We don't use that word very much, sanctify or cons consecrate, but when something is con consecrated, I wanna say concentrated, consecrated or sanctified, it means it's cleansed. It means it's uh, made new, it means it's turned. And so it's, really, kinda, it's uh, really the idea of understanding that you have something in your life that shouldn't be there, and now I wanna release it, I wanna turn from it. Not just being sorry, but actually being repentant in heart and turning from the wicked things that you're doing in your life. And so what he's telling them in verse five here is, hey, if you'll consecrate yourself, if you'll sanctify yourself, get ready, because I'm about to do something. I'm, I'm telling you today, for you in this room, he's empowering you. All you have to do is sanctify yourself, consecrate yourself. Whatever he's telling you that's in your life that you shouldn't be doing, if you'll turn from that, not just be sorry, but actually turn from it and walk away from it. Set it down. If it's drug use, set it down. If it's pornography, set it down. And saying, God, I'm choosing you over that thing in my life. If, if you'll do that today, he says, if you'll sanctify, get ready, because there's wonders that you've never seen coming. Amen? And so he, he, he sets all this up, and he, he's just saying, I need you to adopt a godly attitude. I need you to adopt an attitude of humbleness, integrity, uh, an attitude of relationship with me. And as you consecrate yourself from the things of the world and set yourself on the things of God, he says, I'm gonna meet you with the wonders of heaven, amen? So living this obedient life is like, it's like nothing else in life. It's hard, it's not easy, but I want you to think of it like this. If you're a musician, you can't get in the band until you've mastered your craft. If you're an athlete, you can't get on the field until you've mastered the fundamentals of the sport. If you're a doctor, you can't go into the operating room until you understand an anatomy. If you're a chemist, you can't uh, put chemicals together until you understand and you've learned the periodic table and you understand what chemicals are and when you put things together. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you're a Christian, you cannot go out in an empowered life until you have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, until Christ becomes the one that you're serving, that he, your life has been consecrated and sanctified, set aside, and only put towards the focus of who he is, amen? amen. And so you have to be led but you have to be sanctified as well. You have to be set apart. You have to be cleansed. The church is filled, none of you, none of you, but the church is filled with pseudo-believers, people that have been around the jargon, people that have been around the uh, 
all the things that have been said, all the things, know all the thing, right things to say, but really aren't living a life that is for Christ that's set aside. You hear what I'm saying? There's, there are many, many people that are in church today that are, say they are Christians today, but they're pseudo-Christians. They only have the act, but they don't have the life. And today what he's saying is I'll empower you, but it's got to be about the life. It's got to be about the relationship with Christ. You can't just say the right words. you got to live the right words. And so he's calling us to the sanctified life, this setting aside, moving apart. So for, to have this empowered life, you've got to be spiritually sanctified, conse uh, consecrated, which I would say in your terms today would be spiritually prepared. You have to be prepared to do the things that God's going to ask you to do. You have to be prepared to give an account for the word that's on the inside of you. You have to be prepared to be faith-filled, and that leads us to this third principle that's here. How many of you know when there's principles of God, there's promises that come with them? Amen? And so this third principle today is take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. I've given you two. One is that you follow the Lord, you wait on his timing. And the second one is that you're spiritually prepared. You have readiness in you to do the things that God has asked you to do. This third step is a huge one. Let's read here starting in verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream and they shall stand as a heap. Verse 14, so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows, I told you it was a flood time, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still. Imagine being the priest who carried the ark of God, who carried his presence. Imagine being them. You're walking, all your people are following, You've got this, the promise and presence of God on your life. All of you that know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you. You've got the promise and presence of God in your life. As you walk towards this river, knowing that you're on the east side, but you need to be on the other side, and you're carrying it, and you hear, just put your foot in that raging water right there. I'll take care of everything else. I can imagine what I would do, and I can imagine what most of you would be doing. Like, I'd look over to the guy over on the other side like, we doing? Kyle, we gonna do this? We gonna put our foot in that water? I mean, you know if we put our foot in that water and he doesn't make that water stand still, we're gonna be washed down with this ark. The ark's gonna go with us and I don't know how everybody's gonna follow this thing because we're gonna be gone. But they did it anyway. They got right up to the edge of the river. They stepped in and when they did, when they took a step of faith, when they stepped out, the water, it says heaped up. They got right out in the middle, and the people passed by and went to the other side. I want to tell you today that you've got to be able to step in faith. I want to tell you today that God leads you first by giving you a word, something that you've got to do. To be empowered now, to actually walk in the empowerment of God, you've got to do one thing, step. Many of you are in here today, and God has called you into the mission field, but you'll never go to the mission field until you step. Many of you are teachers but you won't teach until you step. You're small group leaders, but you won't lead a small group until you step. You've got people in your life that need to know Jesus, and they'll never know Jesus till you step. You hear what I'm saying today? You've got to step out. I was in a class long ago with Cordell Mitchell, and in that class, he had us all close our eyes. He was doing this exercise. There was probably 15, 20 of us in there. And we closed our eyes, and he says, okay, I want, to, I want you to picture yourself at the edge of this cliff. And so I, I, I did it just like everybody else. I'm standing at the edge of this cliff. And he said, it's complete darkness. You can't see what's next. For all you know, if you step off of this, you're going to fall to your death. I want you to picture this. So I picture this cliff and we're at this darkness. And then he said, I just want to know, the Holy Spirit wants to know, is there anybody in this room that will take a step? And I jumped up out of my seat right there in that moment and said, I will. And I took a step. Yes. I mean, I was like literally thinking there. And literally, this is what he said. God will light your path every step you take.
God will light your path every step you take. Every step you take, God will meet you there. He will turn the lights on in the darkness. He will, if you will step out into something, if you'll step out into faith and trust me, he says that he will light your path. And ever since then, every time it's a, it's a choice, do I step, do I not? It's like, man, we just, I don't know. Let's just step. Let's just do it. Let's trust God. And he'll meet you right where you're at. Young people, listen to me. He will meet you. You're feeling called right now, some of you. You're feeling called to the ministry. You're feeling called to, to something for God. I'm just telling you, step out. Teach when nobody thought you could teach. Step out and share the gospel with somebody. It doesn't matter. God will meet you right there. I promise you. He'll meet you. Amen? But you got to step out in faith. you got to believe that God will meet you. Let me give you some examples of some guys that did this. Crazy Noah built a boat. Everybody else that thought he was crazy didn't get on the boat. Abraham left home for a place that God was going to show him. All right, man, this is a pretty good place, but we're going to leave and go somewhere else. He became the father of many nations. Moses went before Pharaoh and led his people out of slavery. Esther went to the king, as I told you. David took on Goliath when nobody else would. He took a step of faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they told them not to worship, they worshiped anyway. Thrown into a deadly fire only to walk out unscathed. No smell of smoke, no burn. Peter got out of the boat and walked. And Paul went to the Gentiles and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What I'm telling you this for today is, what's the step that God wants you to take? What's your story? What's the next thing you can do? He said, you go and give them something to eat. What if you just stepped out and fed the homeless? What if you just stepped out and prayed for the sick? What if you just stepped out and led a small group, hosted one, mentored somebody? What if? Could you walk on water? And let me tell you something, even if you miss it, Peter did, he got out, he walked on water, things happened, he started to sink, who was there to get him out? Jesus. I want to tell you this morning, even if you get out there and you start to sink, all you have to do is call out his name, and he will pull you right out of the water. You will not drown. He will relieve you. Amen? We can never be greatly used by God if we're always trying to play it safe. There's a time and a place for playing it safe. It's up until the moment that God moves. When God moves and gives you the word, then it's time to get out of the safety zone and step out. It's time to do something radical and crazy. It's time to trust God. It's time. You can play it safe up to so many moments, but if you're sitting in your chair today and you're like, I just want to see the power of God, are you going to step out or not? Are you going to pray for the sick when he tells you to or not? Are you going to prophesy? Listen, everybody in this room is empowered by God, by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to be able to give a prophetic word. And the only way you can give a prophetic word is you've got to step out from where you're at and release a preceding word that has life in it and give it to somebody. It may not look like what you think, but I guarantee you if it's from God, it will give life and it will not give death. And that's prophetic. So how do you do it? Maybe you just get radical and crazy and God says, I just want you to give like right out of your savings account. Just give something crazy to change lives. Maybe he just says, I just want you to walk into the grocery store and stand there and pay for somebody's groceries. Maybe he says, I told you for three weeks now, give that person $100, go give them $100. Maybe it's go lay hands on them and pray for them. Maybe it's just give them one word, hug them. Do something out of your comfort zone and say, God, I heard you last week tell me, I'm gonna do it this week. I wanna change lives, I want my life changed. I'm stepping out in faith to do what God has called me to do. I'm gonna give them something to eat what I'm gonna give them something to eat I'm not gonna wait on the guy next to me I'm gonna do it that's what he's calling us to do today maybe you should sign up for a missions trip maybe you should uh, uh, try out for the play maybe you should try out for the band maybe you should do something with the talents that God's given you you've just been waiting for it. the fleece has been out it keeps getting wet you try it again I don't know I'm not sure maybe you just step out and say okay God I think I heard you I'm gonna step out in faith and see if you meet me Ooh, what if he meets you what if he meets you 
What if you've got a song on the inside of you that if you'll write it, it'll transform thousands and thousands of lives? What if you're the next Billy Graham and you're going to lead people to Jesus over and over and over and over again? What if you're Oral Roberts and you're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover? What if it's you and you just won't step? What if you just stepped and things would change? It's you. It's not somebody else. It's you. It's the destiny. You've been empowered to do this thing. You're the church. You're the called out ones. You're the ones that God sees. He knows your name. And he's empowered you. You must be willing to take a step. A step of faith. And this last one comes from Joshua chapter four. If you want to turn over there, Joshua chapter four. You got to make a note of God's faithfulness. You have to make a note of God's faithfulness. Let me read this to you. Joshua chapter four, verse five. Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? A representative of each tribe, as they're going from one side of the river to the other, is to take a stone over, a stone of remembrance. And as they take that stone over from one side to the other, they cross, cross through that river and they set that stone down, they're telling a story. They're telling a story of the mighty power and hand of God that happened in their life that they saw that day. Matter of fact, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7, I'll read you something really quick. You don't have to turn there. This is what it's called. 1 Samuel chapter 7, he took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far has the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade Israel, Israelite territory again. So what they're, what they're saying is right there that they went and took a stone of remembrance, an Ebenezer. They set that Ebenezer down. And they said, the Lord will help us, we'll remember this. And when they set that memorial stone down on, in that place, the Philistines never came again. So why am I telling you this? This fourth thing is very important because you can, you can take a step and you can sanctify yourself and you can do all these things that I'm talking about, but if you, can, if you get so comfortable with God that you can't remember what he's done in your life, how can you go into the power of God? He saved you, he brought you out of hell, he, took you right out of the clutches of Satan himself and he put you in a place of hope of heaven. He put you in a place of hope of the spirit of God that's on the inside of you. And if you get so comfortable with God that you're not remembering the things that he's done, how can you go do the things that he's asked you to do? You gotta have a place of Ebenezer's in your life where you're setting memorial stones. You gotta remember my son who's on the front row that he saved him out of the jaws of death when we had thought he had drowned. God brought him back to life. There's things in your life that you know the power of God showed up in an instant and you're just gonna to put them off and not remember them. You've got to have Ebenezer's and remember what God has done so you can be empowered to know that when I step out, my God has been faithful all these times. I can see it. I know where it's at. We're so prone to forget what God has done in our lives. We're, we, we have to have those moments in our lives that we remember. Hey, that's a moment. I need to remember that. For you ladies... Maybe some of you guys, go get you one of those nifty scrapbooks and start scrapbooking all the things that God has done in your life. Get your iPad out, get in the notes and type it all up. And every time you feel like God has left you and you don't know where he's at, pull out your remembrance of what God has done in your life, how he saved you, how he's healed you, how he's, how he's brought you out of places that you never thought you could get out of, how he's made you recover, how he's turned you from your wicked ways and into some uh, things that you never thought that you could do, how he's put you in a position to be able to minister to people. He's called you, Carly, to be a woman of God, somebody that he can trust, somebody that he's given so much to. You have a heritage 
uh, in your life that God has set aside for you, just you. And if you could just stand in front of people and say, this is my heritage. I was listening to a story just uh, earlier before the first service of a heritage of a godly family from 1800s that they didn't know about and they just heard about this weekend. And they were so pumped up about the heritage that they learned of this weekend. And I think, what if our kids knew our heritage? What if we put something up and we built it up and we shared with those around us, those Ebenezers that are in our life, how God showed up and he showed out, and he changed the course of our family's history just by showing up. What if he hadn't saved Joe and Biff Bain and then Stephanie? What if he hadn't? I would have never been here right now, but he did. And when he did, I got an Ebenezer from somebody else because I know that my God is for me and that he set me aside for this moment, and I'm going to step out in faith because God has called me in Jesus' name. What if? I know he, this is what he does. He gets all teary-eyed and spitting and all that stuff. But I want to tell you, I'm passionate about how God has brought me out of hell and given me purpose and hope. And I just want you to be that passionate. And when you get out of here today, you say, I'm going to give them something to eat. I'm going to step in faith because God has called me to the mission field. God has called me to the work of the gospel in Jesus' name. So powerful. we got to have a place a special moment, that consecrated baptism, being saved, all those things that have happened, saving your son, saving your mother, saving your sister. You've got those moments. You've got to keep them. They're Ebenezer's. They're memorial stones. And he tells them to do it. And the reason he tells them to do it is so you would know that you need to do it too. How are you ever going to go to the other side of the river and remember what he's done if you don't have a stone to remember by? Do you have any? Write them down. Keep a souvenir. Do something. Tie a string on your finger. Whatever it takes. I know some people keep a coin uh, in their pockets for different reasons. Some of it's AA, some of it's different things. I've seen people, it has the gospel on it, and they just want to share. This is what God, I can remember. I have this coin to remind me. I reach in my pocket, and I touch it just so I know what God has done for me. You hear what I'm saying today? Sometimes you got to look in the mirror and you got to remind yourself you are a man of God and this is what God has done for me. And I'm going out today into the face of the enemy and I know that God is on my side. I know I may not feel it the way I did one day, but I know that he is on my side. The enemy is not going to take me over. I am an, an, an empowered believer of God and the enemy can try every scheme that he wants to try. But I'm telling you today, my victory is right here. I am putting my foot into the water and that river is going to pile up and I'm going to the other side because God is called me to the other side. He has empowered me to go to the other side, and here I am pointing fingers at you again. <laughs> you may never walk across a river that had piled up. You may never walk on water. You may never write two-thirds of the Bible. You may never have thousands and thousands and thousands of people at your funeral. But that's not why we're in it. We're in it to get him glory. And when we get through with this life, what we've been empowered with is what's going to matter and what we did with it. And today, I'm telling you, he's calling each and every one of you to something greater. All you have to do is step out in faith. You've been empowered. Sanctify yourself. Get rid of the thing that he keeps telling you to get rid of. Set it aside and say, God, you know, I hear you. I hear you. Somebody asked me not too long ago about drinking. Listen, I'm not here to tell you drinking yes or drinking no. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit convicted me one way, and that's the way I went. Let him convict you and go the way that he's asking you to go. If you know he's telling you to give something up, then give it up. It's what you do with the truth. Not what I'd tell you to do with the truth. It's what you do with the truth. Today, he's telling you truths and he's giving something. He's putting things into your heart that you know that I've got to answer to and I need to do something with. It's really simple. We can make an impact for the kingdom of God right here, right now, because he's empowering us to do it. You're in here today, you're here for a reason. And that's to hear the goodness of God and know that he has called you to share it with somebody else. Amen? So good. So the question is, do you want to experience the, and experience the adventure of faith with God? 
Do you want to step out of the boat? Do you want to step out into the water? Do you want to do those things that God has called you to do? If you do, you're in the right place today because Holy Spirit says, everybody that steps today, I'll meet them. I'll meet them. I will meet them. I have called them and I will meet them. So, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna have you close your eyes, bow your head. If you're in this room today and you've never met Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, now's your opportunity. Do you wanna be used by God if you're in here and you do know him? Today you can make a real choice, a real stand for where you're at and your walk with him. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you say, today is my day, I want to do that, would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray with you. I see you there. Just keep your hand up. Maybe you said, I've been far from God and I just want to recommit myself. Would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you as well. I see you there and there and there. Everybody in the room, pray with me this prayer. Father God, I accept your son, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Change my life. I accept that you died on the cross for me. That you took stripes upon your back so that I would be healed and whole. And you raised from the dead on the third day and are ascended into heaven, Jesus. Take over my life. You are my king. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give them a hand clap. Such a powerful time when we have people come into the family. We're so thankful. I know this, that there's a party being thrown right now for those of you that made this decision today to say, Jesus is my king. Heaven is just rejoicing. You have hope and eternity forever with him as your Lord and Savior. Now, in just a moment, I'm gonna have you stand to your feet, and when you do, I'm just gonna ask you to be a little bit radical. I'm just gonna ask you to be a little bit crazy. Prayer team's gonna come this way when everybody stands their feet, but also for you that say, you know what? I just wanna take a step of faith. I know God's been telling me something, and I just wanna step out and say, God, I, I, I don't know how it's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm gonna trust you that it will happen, and I'm gonna step out in faith. And I just want you to come to the altars if that's you. We wanna lay hands on you and pray for you. So prayer team, come forward. Everybody stand to your feet. If that's you and you wanna fill these altars, the altars are open for you. I'll give you just a moment to come this way. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. God, we magnify you. If you're out there and you need prayer this morning for anything, if, you got, if you're battling health issues, financial issues, relationship issues, I want to step out and be bold in, in my faith towards God. Whatever it is, these folks are here to pray with you. They come ready. The Bible says that in agreement prayer, when two or more are gathered together, that he's there in their midst, that things happen right in that moment. Never sitting back and waiting for something to happen, but saying, God, I'm always going to step towards you in faith. Amen. Raise your hands. I want to speak a blessing over you this morning. Father, we thank you. God, I thank you for each of these. And Lord, I thank you that you are moving heaven and earth for these folks. God, those that are in their hearts saying, God, I want it, I want it, I want it. You're going to meet them there right now in Jesus' name. Just as Peter said, bid me to come, and he stepped out on the water today, we say, bid us to come, and we will step out on the water. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. Lead us this week. Lord, thank you for your empowerment. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, you guys go with God. We'll see you next week. Love for me. They said he's not.